Uh, welcome to our virtual Wayland Library Great Presenters event. Tonight, we are excited to have artist Barbara Grad here to talk about her paintings and her process. Barbara earned a BFA and an MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. She's a professor emeritus at the Massachusetts College of Art and Design and a founding member of one of the first women's art collaboratives in America. Her awards include Art Berkshire Taconic Foundation, William Hicks Fellowship, the Mass Cultural Council, two Brown Fellowships, an Art Institute of Chicago Award and an NEA Individual Artist Award. Her work is represented by the Howard Yazersky Gallery in Boston. Thank you so much to Barbara for being here tonight. I just have a couple of housekeeping notes. First, that we are recording this session for possible broadcast on Wacam, which is our local cable access channel and for the library's YouTube page. So you will be able to watch and share this again. Um, I'm recording my video, Barbara's video and Barbara's slides, no one else. Um, Barbara will speak for about 40, 45 minutes and then we'll have time for questions and answers. So please feel free to put your questions in the chat at any time so you don't forget them uh, or hang on to them and you'll, you're welcome to read them aloud or speak them aloud at the end. Um, just note that if you do that, your voice will be part of the recording. So now that I've got that all out of the way, we are ready to get started and I will hand it over to Barbara. Hi there, everyone. Good evening and uh, welcome. Thank you, Courtney, for your kind words of introduction. And thank you, Steve, wherever you are, I hope you're listening, uh, for inviting me to do this talk. I'm here to give you a little insight of who I am as an artist tonight. And I'll talk about my paintings through a series of images my, I'll start out with my beginnings in Chicago, and I'll talk about influences and inspirations and how they affect my paintings. And then I'll also go through building the painting and how I actually put the um, paint on the canvas and layer it. I'll take questions at the end. So um, here we go. Uh, the first slide, which you've been staring at, I've always wanted to know the difference between a mark that was art and a mark that wasn't. This quote was projected at the National Gallery in Washington, uh, D.C. And uh, I'm sorry, uh, this isn't working, okay. Uh, there, sorry, uh, this, <laughs> this quote was um, projected at the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. Um, it's asking what is art. Roy Lichtenstein was an American pop artist who used popular culture, primarily comic book images, through parody as a new art new movement. Artists ask questions and reveal how they see the world around them. But this is what I do, large uh, paintings, 72 inches to 106 inches, oil on linen. I make paintings about the world as I see it. It took me a long time to get to, the, to, get to paint like this. So I'm gonna take you back to my beginnings in Chicago and tell you about how I grew up with Picasso and uh, Van Gogh. Uh, when I was eight years old, my mother and I took a subway to the Art Institute of Chicago, where we both took classes. Her class began 15 minutes before mine, so she dropped me off at the door of my classroom, which actually was right inside the museum. Uh, right next to the, my classroom door was this painting called The Red Armchair. So every week I would talk to Picasso and ask him, how did he ever manage to create such an image of a woman in a chair? I had never seen anything like it. I, you know, I was eight years old. I love the colors. I love the shapes, but it was beyond me. And I could never figure out how he did it. 
Um, then in the next room around the corner, I would uh, walk over to my second favorite painting, The Bedroom uh, by Van Gogh. And I would talk to Van Gogh and think, tell him what a great bedroom he had. And I actually made my mother paint my bedroom blue. She kept telling me blue is for boys. And I kept saying, no, I want a blue bedroom because I wanted a bedroom like Van Gogh. <laughs> <laughs> it was so comfortable and I just, I, I just loved it. Um, I didn't understand until um, quite later that Picasso was deconstructing the figure into shape and color. And he was influenced by artists, historical artists, and also African art. Um, Van Gogh was working from life. Their approaches um, used very different systems to create art that was powerful, um, there was a powerful uh, personal image. At my high school graduation, I was awarded the art prize with one condition. If uh, accepted at the Art Institute of Chicago, I would attend. So a few weeks later, when I got my acceptance, I was stuck and I was really scared. Um, this, this was, this was the scariest thing. So the, the, uh, entry to the school in those days was right up the, um, front stairs. And every day when I would go to school, the first person I would meet was Lee Goody, a bad lady who sat on the steps making portraits of folks she saw and selling them for $5. This is one of her portraits on the left. You can now see them in many museums. I love these portraits and still do. They were simple shapes, the color, um, creating a sense of personality. Every portrait she did was different and everyone had a personality. When I uh, got to the school as a graduate student, uh, my painting professor was Ray Yoshida, and he befriended an untrained artist, Joseph Joachim, uh, who lived nearby in Chinatown. Ray brought, bought all of um, Joachim's drawings, or a lot of them, and brought them into the school and hung them up in the student gallery for all his students to see. I was just blown away. I loved them from the moment I saw them, and I still love them today. Um, I, he was doing these uh, wonderful, simple landscapes with ballpoint pen, uh, colored pencils on paper. Uh, I asked Ray, um, how did he do these? I, I couldn't imagine. And Ray said that he had been in the Navy his whole life and the ship docked all over the world. And every place the ship docked, he would buy postcards. And when he was 70 years old, he brought out all the postcards and with his memory and the postcards decided to document all the places that he had been. Um, I was doing very, very different things at this time. I was really experimenting with materials and ideas. Uh, the idea of nature and man-made shapes seemed really exciting to me. The, this slide represents two works from an exhibition I had at the museum when I graduated as an MFA student. I had won a fellowship that year from uh, at graduation, and I also won an NEA, a National Endowment for the Arts from Washington, D.C. The um, drawing on the left, it, uh, I had cut wood in strips that were a half inch wide and about 30 inches long. 
and I physically wove them through a silver veneer rice paper. Um, there are shards of photographic shapes of landscape glued onto the silver veneer and graphite drawing on the surface as well. Uh, the one on the right was a large unstretched canvas with graphite drawing and uh, metallic powders rubbed into the surface of the painting. Uh, the, the stripes are done with oil paint. Um, so it was, a, it was a hybrid painting of um, uh, drawing and painting. I wanted a landscape that felt current, that felt exciting. Living in the city, the idea of landscape combined with uh, um, a man-made shape seemed very exotic to me. Now I live um, right in nature and it's not so exotic, but it's still very, very interesting. As a student, I spent two years uh, as an undergraduate student studying photography and continue to take photographs almost every day. They inspire ideas, images, and colors. I want to show you how the photographs I take um, influence my paintings, how I see the world, what I find interesting and exciting. Um, the first one on the left, I took in Kansas City. I was visiting there. I, uh, I had an opening of a solo show at the Kemper Museum of Contemporary Art. And uh, we were out to dinner at night and I looked out the window and there was the garage below and it looked like the Martians were coming to see my show. Um, and actually it was the reflection of the chandeliers in the restaurant. But I love the inside and outside being melded together and um, creating one space. The photo next to it is um, a very simple photograph of just leaves on the uh, surface of a pond with the reflections of trees and sky and um, uh, clouds uh, uh, all sandwiched together in one space. And the one below is a reflection of oil on water that I'd taken near some boats in the vineyard. My first iPhone camera was pretty slow, but I found that if I moved the camera, the um, whole phone really quickly while I was taking the picture, it would create a stutter in the, um, in the image. And uh, this gave me ideas for how to deconstruct the image into an abstraction. Unfortunately, I traded this phone for, in for a newer one, and the newer ones have much better shutter speeds and don't allow for this kind of play. But the process is also about stumbling into a process. Smarter View on the left was done in 2012, and Partial Recall was also done in 2012 on the right. Here I use that stutter as a means for deconstructing the landscape image into a hybrid painting that was both abstract and a believable space, thinking about the many current issues of landscape, how landscape is divided, the borders are changing due to wars, um, environmental issues, oil spills, fracking, climate, these were all really important uh, ideas about landscape. And how could I represent some of these ideas? Um, sorry. Uh, in a painted image, how could I represent these uh, images as a painted space? Um, 
how to paint the landscape in the present tense uh, and what would that look like? I went back and I started seriously looking at Helen Frankenthaler. I always loved her um, abstract landscapes. Her quote down below, I think of my pictures as explosive landscapes, worlds and distances held on a flat space. Oh, when I saw that quote, I thought, oh my God, that's exactly what I want to do, but I want to do it in my space, in the time where I'm living. Uh, Helen Frankenthaler was using poured color and shape to create her paintings. And I wanted something about living today. At the same time uh, that Helen Frankenthaler was doing her poured paintings in New York, uh, David Park was doing uh, his image work on the West Coast, this was 1950s. Um, he was another artist that um, really influenced my work. The color in David Park's paintings was so believable and so vibrant. It wasn't real. He didn't have a need for details, for eyelashes, um, but through the form and the color, he told me everything I wanted to know about the image. So after a trip to Colorado, I wanted to do a painting about red rocks. Red rocks, if you don't know, is the most incredible amphitheater outside in Colorado, right, right outside of Denver. And it's a place, um, uh, it's got a huge stage, orchestras from all over the world have played there, the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, you name it, you've played it, Red, red Rocks. And we were there in February, unfortunately, they only um, have, can have concerts in, um, in the summertime. So we hiked around in these big red rock mountains. It was just wonderful. I went home and I started this painting and I kept the gravity on the bottom, but I had these sort of rock, red rock, floating images on top. And I thought this was such a, it seemed like such a good idea, but it's a terrible painting. So I put it aside in my storage. And um, 2017, I took it out again because I had just come back from another trip um, to Denver and Red Rocks. But this time I got to go to a concert the concerts are at night and they're incredible. They have red lights everywhere, right? um, lighting up the stage and the rocks all around you. And the, the sound is absolutely incredible. And I started repainting the painting. Uh, I kept the gravity um, toward the bottom of the painting. And um, I, and then I started deconstructing the mountains into color and line. And I thought this time I got it right. Um, Van Gogh said, one must spoil as many canvases as one succeeds with. And this was very comforting to me. Um, here's my studio where the paintings are made. Um, it's uh, a simple space with a lot of lights, skylights and windows. Um, it's big enough to do large paintings and small paintings and mid-sized paintings. Um, after the painting next to the file cabinets is a painting I did after a trip to the Serengeti in Tanzania that's in Africa. I painted the, um, 
the arid plains next to the waterhole, and then the high rock formations where the lions had their dens and were able to have their cubs um, away from predecessors. But it also, those dens um, where the lions were looked down on their prey so that the male lions could go hunting and feed the family. I thought this was a great metaphor for the time. Uh, the, here's two more images of my studio. Uh, this is my palette and my drawing table. I call it messy thinking. I play with color, shape, and line until it feels right. I work privately and slowly. You can see here how the color outside influenced my color du jour. Um, it's about building a painting. The paint is forgiving. You can layer it, you can scrape it. It's both additive and subtractive. Um, and on the right is my drawing table. It always looks like this. It wasn't just set up for the day. Um, it's always piled with photos and drawings and colors and all kinds of things. It's where I do my messy thinking. Uh, here I am building my stretchers. Uh, it, it's a wood frame. I'm, uh, I still love to make my own stretchers. Um, I'm stapling a raw linen onto the, um, uh, onto the frame of the canvas. And then I'll turn it over and put gesso on top of it so that the paint sits on top of the gesso and I can move it around easier than if it would um, be absorbed into the linen. The uh, photograph on the right uh, has a few of the paintings from 2016-17. And here I was thinking about the contradictions that were always in the news, conflicts and collisions of interests, um, and possibly using all these ideas uh, for a metaphor. Um, we live in our times um, using water for that metaphor. This is a small canvas, it's 18 by 20 inches. And here I'm taking the patterns and uh, light reflections from water and just using them uh, to uh, create an abstraction of the power of nature. Back to my photography. I'm in Maine here, and uh, I'm looking at the space and light in Maine. And how do I take that space and light and use it in my paintings? I came home and I started working on this painting, White Rain, 2015 16. Um, it was uh, a painting of, again, reflections of water and pattern. Uh, oftentimes when I say I repaint, I actually mean I layer. I enjoy using the history of the first failed attempt and I build on top of it an image. Um, so you can see that very clearly toward the bottom and around the middle of the painting where their image and image and image just layered on top. Um, if you paint thin enough with oil paint, um, you can go over it very quickly um, the same later the same day or the next day. Um, it dries very, it, it doesn't take months and weeks to, it's not, it's not completely dry, but it's dry enough to, to paint on it. Um, this is Cats and Dogs, uh, done around the same time, 2015-16. And the day I started this painting, it was raining cats and dogs, sheets of rain against the window of the studio. 
and it felt like waterfalls. Um, and I started thinking about, of course, the patterns and using them to create the depth of space um, in the painting. These are uh, two paintings from a show in 2016 at the Howard Uzerski Gallery. Uh, Cats and Dogs is on the right and uh, Subjective Truth is on the left. They're both about 70, 72 inches. And here's a better view of Subjective Truth. A lot of times I'll take um, photos from the news or the newspaper. Um, what I'm thinking about. Um, this is 62 by 72 by 70 inches. It's oil and linen. And you can see very clearly how I've layered um, the imagery in the center um, where I'm working with the idea of light uh, coming down in a space, in a, in a shape. On, on the landscape. This painting was called Ground Game. It was done in 2017. It's a pretty big one, 60 by 72, oil on linen. And the um, photo on the left is from the stairwell at the Y in Framingham, where I used to go before COVID to exercise all the time. Here you can see how I use the idea of the fragments of light and planes as a layer of history in the large painting. The, here I was thinking about landscape very differently. I was thinking about war games, airstrikes, all forming one space. The idea of landscape keeps shifting for me with the times. I want the painting to feel like a current view of the world, um, complex and disorienting. There's a hint of gravity that loses its place both in the photo and in the painting. So when you look at this painting, you'd think that I did the brown landscape first and then painted the um, the shapes uh, on top of it. And it's actually just the opposite. I was working from the, um, from the photo and I painted the shapes uh, on the canvas and they were just flat colors, um, yellow, red, green, just random colors of shapes. And then I started um, taking them apart. And um, I looked at the painting for a long, long time, trying to figure out what in the world I was gonna do with the rest of it and how I was gonna actually make it into a painted space. It was interesting to look at. Um, then I had the idea I would put a landscape in. So since I was thinking about landscapes, so I painted in the brown in back of these flat colored shapes. And then I went back into the shapes and uh, made them partner with the landscape uh, in the back. Um, and then uh, they connect up on top of the painting and then as I worked down toward the bottom, I decided to disconnect them so that they were actually floating as shards broken off and, and uh, the landscape collapsed in back of it. This is um, a large painting where I called it bluff. I was imagining a landscape, a large cliff, and I was on that cliff in an endless space. Um, I wanted the space to be an illogical space, one that you couldn't really walk through or move through, um, but still having an atmosphere to see into it. 
And here it is um, hanging in a, an exhibition at the Howard Uzerski Gallery in um, 2020. Uh, Bluff is on the left and the painting on the right was called Air Under Water. Here's a better view of air underwater. Um, it's oil on canvas. It was very large, it was like 106 inches, two panels that I connected. Uh, thinking about the storms at sea, the fight for clean water, using the patterns of water reflections as a line uh, reconstructed as a powerful force. In 2018, before our pandemic year, um, I traveled to Morocco to camp at the Sahara Desert. It was one of my dreams to camp, to see the Sahara, um, to ride through the desert on a camel, to see those golden sands. And we got up in the morning to board the bus to go to the Sahara and it was pouring rain. It never rains in Morocco. It rains one day a year and that was the day. And it rained the whole day um, to the Sahara. And it was like the desert had turned green. We stopped for lunch and everyone thanked us for bringing the rain. Uh, I didn't know what to think. Uh, my desert vision wasn't entirely crushed because the next day I woke up and the sun was shining and we got on those camels and we um, rode into our camp. <laughs> um, and the whole way there, I started thinking about, you know, the climate and the spiritual implications of that day, everything turning from turning green, that of course is not a manipulated photograph. That's exactly what I was looking at. And then just riding through these beautiful uh, golden sands. Um, uh, the painting was finished in 2020 and the trip was again in 2018. So sometimes it takes a long time to digest an idea and figure out how in the world I'm going to paint it. And the painting comes about little by little. It changes a lot while I'm painting and I'm constantly adding and taking away and uh, creating uh, the painted space I'm after. Here I am, we had just hung up the painting in March 2000, uh, March 20th, 2020, um, a couple friends ran in to see the show hanging uh, for the day uh, after we hung it. And then the next day, the building and Boston closed down for the pandemic. The gallery and the building were closed for months. And here I am giving all of my supporters a big hug, wishing everyone uh, keep well and safe um, at home. But here is um, the painting tomorrow, which was in the previous slide. And uh, it was done on two panels. And the two top images are actually the progress of how I painted the painting. It, there are different stages of building the painting. Um, the upper left image is the beginning and then next to it, you can see how much is added and how much is taken away. In the beginning painting, I thought about layers and I wanted to physically use the break in the two panels to kind of shift those layers to stutter them in a space. And I painted on this for a long time. 
And I stepped back and I thought, God, that was such a good idea. And it's such a terrible painting. Uh, I just uh, I couldn't believe it. So I got out the palette again, the oil paints, and just began to connect the two panels. I figured there has to be a way to pull this all together. It's just too big to uh, call a disaster. Um, and uh, I finally got down to the bottom. So you can see where I connected, finally connected the two panels, um, throwing in some uh, shapes, uh, geometric shapes as a nod to all the stuff that's floating around in the ocean that you don't wanna know about. Um, that crazy geometric thing that's in the ocean that we also don't want to know about. And then trying to make this landscape in um, across the upper part of the painting so uh, that I was keeping the integrity of each color as a separate um, entity. Uh, a, sep a separate identity. Um, each color I was thinking was uh, a culture and all these cultures were banding together and forming one land, one cohesive piece um, surrounded by water. I, that was my wish for tomorrow. This next painting was also in that same victim show, the show that was a victim of the pandemic. It was called Echo. I started the painting on the left and um, it began as a landscape. Uh, I wanted it to be broken. I wanted it to be falling apart. It was a very confusing idea and it turned into a very confusing painting. I didn't know where to look first. I loved, um, you know, certain areas of the painting. I thought there were fragments that were uh, really great, but the whole painting was not um, working as a cohesive space. I thought about um, uh, cutting it apart and making small paintings, but um, that really didn't sit right either. And I think that comes from my um, background in photography, believe it or not. My teacher, Ken Josephson, insisted that we um, uh, show uh, the entire photograph we had to compose in the camera. Um, we had to print our photographs with the black, negative line around them. This is black and white photography back then. And so I really learned to compose within the parameter. And I think that's really helped me a lot um, in my paintings, especially the, um, the paintings that are, on, that are stretched on a canvas. You really have this, um, uh, this edge and you've got to work inside of it. Um, so if you take the V shape on the bottom of the painting on the left, and in your mind's eye, if you turn it upside down, you can find it uh, in the painting on the right, in the upper right-hand corner. So you can see how I uh, turned it upside down and started painting. I wanted to first connect those uh, jewel-like red rocks in the center. And I wanted them broken, not completely um, connected. And, but I wanted water to kind of be seeping through. And then I had no idea what I was gonna to do to the top of the painting. And I remember being in Maine, um, looking out, I was on a boat, looking out on the ocean and seeing um, uh, islands. 
And uh, I thought, oh, those were great shapes. I can put them in the back of the space and create, uh, you know, uh, a little bit of interest back there. So I put in these dark mounds and all of a sudden I realized that I had an echo and I love that. So then I started repainting the, um, the light blue echo and the bottom and the top uh, darker shades of blue to enhance the echo and uh, make it um, the subject of the work. And this painting is called Echo. After all of those beautiful paintings came back to my storage area, I decided to work small for a while. It was 2020, it was the pandemic, and um, I sat down at my drawing table and I did a whole series of works on paper that were uh, 14 inches by 11 inches. They were done with watercolor on paper. And uh, I found myself uh, during that time period uh, just walking around the property, looking at my old mountain laurel that lined the driveway. It had been neglected for many years. I was painting and I wasn't out there trimming uh, plants. So I decided, well, it's 2020, I am at home and it's time to take care of those mountain laurels. So I cut out all the dead and I was left with these crazy twisting, turning stalks with um, leaves up on top. It was all the new growth. And the new growth just uh, seemed to be really excited with what I was doing. And so I made a whole series of works. There's about 75 to 100 of these small works uh, on paper. In 2021, we're all vaccinated and I started getting out a little bit uh, around the area. Um, here I took photographs uh, of the Sudbury River, a mountain laurel in my yard, and the base of my favorite tree, which had to come down the year before because it was very close to the house and it was completely rotten. I couldn't believe that this beautiful tree outside my kitchen window, which I absolutely loved, was rotten. It was so, it was so beautiful, so healthy looking. The leaves on it didn't have a hint of anything wrong. And the arborist came around and said, nope, this has got to go. Otherwise, you're going to be in big trouble. And they started chopping away at the tree. And um, it was healthy, healthy, healthy. And I thought, oh my God, if they get to the bottom and it's still healthy, I am just going to never stop screaming. And they got to the bottom and it was completely rotten. I couldn't believe how healthy it looked. And yet it was on the verge of collapse. How nature twists and turns and fights for survival to get to the light it morphs and changes with the environment to survive. It's all about survival, I think, these new paintings. Um, the paintings I'm doing this year in 2021 are small. This one is 30 by 24 inches. Uh, this next painting is also a painting from this year. I had started this painting in 2014 on the left and um, also decided, nope, uh, it just wasn't working. So I kind of buried it away in the studio. And then this year I took it out and I said, and I really liked the center shapes, the colors and the broken but beautiful jewel-like colors. So I began to uh, repaint it or layer it. 
um, in 2021. Um, uh, again, I turned it, but this time I turned it on its side um, so that the pink stream on the left is now on the bottom of the right painting. Uh, much of the middle smaller color shapes remain in the painting to the right. Um, here I was thinking about distance. Uh, what could be far away and what was close up and how could I create that sense of space and distance on the canvas. Uh, this painting is called How Far Is Away and it's 24 by 20 inches. Uh, this is the last slide I'm going to show you tonight. And uh, this is a part of the studio. I was getting ready for a wonderful studio visit I had. I had uh, just last uh, October, 17 collectors and art lovers from Chicago came to my studio to see my work and talk about the paintings. Um, so if you're in town, if you're near uh, Boston or Wayland, contact me. And uh, we opened up the skylights, opened up the windows, turned on the fans, and everybody survived the, um, the studio visit. And you're welcome to make an appointment for a studio visit. Um, thank you all for listening. And I'll take some questions now. Thank you so much, Barbara. That was wonderful. We have a whole bunch of questions in the chat. Okay. Um, so start there, um, but if anyone is wanting to speak aloud, just uh, wave your video. <laughs> um, so first, um, Marty is asking, do you ever project the images such as water and reflections from your photos onto the canvas as a start to your shapes, or are you drawing the patterns using the photo as a reference? I do both, Marty. Um... You know, uh, if I get really stuck on a painting and I really don't know, I'll uh, pull out a projector and I'll start projecting um, images. I have a lot of images that I've put on um, uh, uh, the transparent paper that I can, I have an old projector and I just throw up some images to uh, to, to see what it looks like. And once I have a sense of what it looks like, then I can go in and start painting it. Um, sometimes I go back and, and look at, uh, at drawings, but you know, it's a hard call to try and figure out how you're gonna make the connections. And that happens when you have the paintbrush in your hand, I'm sorry to say. And there's a whole lot of mistakes that come along with that. <laughs> um, I hope that answered it. <laughs> um, another comment from Marty and, and then a question from someone else. And I think they're both referring to the painting where you were looking at the YMCA stairway. Um, huh? Marty says, I really appreciate how much you see the world see in the world around you. The stairway from the Y is so powerful yet commonplace. The painting takes those moments and elevates them. And then someone is asking, have you made prints or woodcuts? Those patterns and marks have that reference to me. You know, I've, I always love woodcuts and I've always wanted to make them and maybe I will. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Um, I've made uh, some uh, lithographs in my past, um, but uh, those are still sitting in a drawer waiting for me to uh, make marks on top of them. I never felt like they were uh, um, completely whole. Um, so I also need to get those out. I have to live for another hundred years to do all the things I want to do. <laughs> um, and one more comment from Marty. Uh, she was your student 30 years ago. She says, you really impacted my work ethic and commitment to a studio practice. However, teaching takes up so much of my time. 
have you found your time in the studio has changed for the better after retiring? Oh God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was, um, I, I'm, I, I, I'm thrilled that you say that about my, I, I worked so hard. I, I, I really wanted my students to be uh, better than I was. And uh, I, I gave them everything I, I could possibly think of giving them. Um, I, it, was very, it was a very, very hard time. I was trying to do my own work. I was um, full-time teaching and uh, I was raising a child. So all those things, I, I told people I had three full-time jobs. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then a, a, another question about teaching. How did your art influence your teaching or vice versa? Oh, <laughs> I learned so much from my students. I remember one day walking into someone's studio and they were painting with these colors that were just, at the time they were unheard of. It was like pink and purple. And I walked into the studio and I said, where did you find this palette? And he said, oh, and he opened up a magazine and showed me um, an advertisement. And I went, oh. Of course, it's your time. It's your, you know, he's looking at, you know, uh, ads from this magazine that he had. I don't know what it was, I don't remember, um, but it was something that I would never have picked up. And it really opened my eyes. I mean, the students would make comments. And so I think I learned from them. Uh, you know, I hope as much as they learn from me. <laughs> Great. Um, we have a few sort of technical questions. So someone's asking, how do you work on the huge paintings? Is the canvas on the wall or on the floor? Physically, how do you work on those paintings? <laughs> um, I always uh, build them on the floor and I gesso them on the floor and I let the, I let the gesso dry with the four corners of, um, of the canvas on the floor so that they don't warp. Um, then I always hang them up and I paint on them when they're hanging. Um, I always think, oh God, I should, I should really uh, move them to the floor. Because when I was a student, I used to, uh, paint both on the floor and on the wall. But I think as I, you know, as I've got grown older, it's easier for me to paint um, when it's on the wall now. <laughs> you know, sorry to say, uh, <laughs> it's, just, it's just physically easier. Um, but, and, and while I'm painting, if I get stuck, I'll turn it on its side, I'll turn it upside down, I'll walk away from it, I'll come back. Um, in the old days, I used to have a cigarette. God, <laughs> I miss that. <laughs> but I haven't done that in over 30 years. And I'm not going to start again. <laughs> yeah. um, so here's a related question. Can you speak a bit more about mistakes and incorporating them into your work? When do you know to scrap something and start over? versus working with it? Well, I used to tell my, my students that if it's not totally satisfying, if it's not really, if the whole thing isn't working for you, then it's really not working. And you've just got to face it and do something else to it. And I remember that and I try and uh, use that for myself. Um, if it's if the painting isn't holding together for me as a painted space, um, then it's got to do something else. And as hard as it might be, and sometimes I don't know what that something else is. And when I don't know, I completely turn it upside down and start again. And it gives me a fresh look and a way to move forward. 
And it's a lot of looking and a lot of time spent, um, you know, and a, a lot of uh, days where I just shut the the door of my studio and say, oh God, I can't make a painting. I'll never make a painting again. <laughs> <laughs> this is the end of me. This painting is going to do me in. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's, um, it's a struggle. <laughs> uh, one last chat question. And then if anyone else wants to speak up, um, like, this person says, your art is gorgeous. Is it all freehand or are you cutting your own stencils for some shapes? She so appreciates your roadmap. When your triangle shape was in the upper side of the canvas, had you turned the canvas upside down? I'm not quite sure which slide she's referring to, but. Hmm, I, I, I've never used stencils. I, I, I wouldn't know how to use a stencil. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> and I don't use tape either. Uh, my students use tape, and I used to ask them, oh, what kind of tape are you using? And I would look at it, and I don't know, I just, I don't know, I never, I, it didn't appeal to me. Um, huh. Uh, 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 I wish I had a road map. You know, a lot of artists uh, make collages uh, on their computers, and then they print out the collage, and then they paint from that as a road map. And I've always kind of envied that, and I think, oh God, you know, I should really do that. It would be so easy. I wouldn't have all the angst and stress of, you know, uh, 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 of um, trying to make this work. But I feel like if I'm not surprised by it, then my viewer isn't going to be surprised by it. And I really love that, um, that feeling of discovery, of really discovering the image as I'm making it. And that's one of the joys of making art, you know, finding that mystery and uncovering it and it's it's you know you feel like you're you're on an adventure and you have no idea um how it's going to end it's not a story with a beginning or an end you're just in a process and at some point you're going to stand back and go wow i did that and it always surprises me and that's all I can say. Uh, I'm sorry to tell you that I, I don't know how to use a stencil. <laughs> oh, no, no, it's just curiosity, I think. Um, when someone just commented, your angst and stress is your power. <laughs> so. Well, if, if that's what it takes, okay. <laughs> I guess I have to live with that. Yeah. I thought I was just a crazy person. <laughs> So we have a lot of questions. I mean, a lot of Bravo comments, which I will definitely share with uh, Barbara after um, the program. And someone asked, will this recording be made available? Yes, it will. And I will try to email it to all the folks uh, who registered. Um, someone's asking, when is your next show? Oh. <laughs> Ask Howard <laughs> at the Howard Uzerski Gallery. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I, I really don't. Um, I, I think the, the it, he was, it, he had such a hard time um, with uh, 2020, uh, the building and gallery closed for so long. He's got so, he had so many artists just waiting uh, mm -hmm. for shows that are all backlogged. And um, my moment was just a victim. There were a lot of victims during that 2020 year. I wasn't alone with that. Um, and I'm hopeful that uh, that will um, have another show. Howard was just in the studio uh, a little while ago. And we talked about uh, maybe having a show of small paintings next of the paintings I'm doing now. Um, hopefully I won't, uh, I sold a few, so hopefully I, uh, 
can all excel the wall before we do, we schedule an exhibition. <laughs> Does anyone have any more questions? Feel free to unmute. If uh, looks like Luann is trying to unmute. Is that true? No. <laughs> Okay, anyone else? Um, it's now or never. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, thank you so much to Barbara for this wonderful talk. Oh, Luann did raise her hand. I'm going to just see if I can unmute her. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Barbara. It's Luann. I just Hi. wanted to say, you know, I really loved your talk. And I'm just wondering if there is anything you can tell us about what your next direction is going to be. You really told us a lot about where you gained the influences for, um, for the paintings that you showed us tonight. But I'm wondering, where are you traveling to next and what can we expect to see? Mm -hmm. Boy, um, I never quite know. Um, Right now, I've been uh, sticking close to home. Um, I, I, uh, I, I don't know. I would love to travel again. Um, I was hoping in 2020, I had planned a trip to the south of France. I wanted to go to all those um, little museums, the uh, Picasso, Picasso, Miro, um, Matisse Museum, they're all on the, um, on the coast in the south of France. I wanted to uh, uh, see the coast and, and see where all these wonderful paintings of Matisse uh, were done and uh, where the artists lived, their houses, and uh, I wanted to get a sense of that coast and that trip was canceled and I, I'm waiting uh, to do that trip again. Um, I don't know, maybe this summer. Uh, so maybe you'll see, I don't know, coastal air scenes or maybe uh, riffs on some of the art that I'm going to see there. Um, I don't know, that was, uh, the big trip that was um, canceled. Uh, it, it's hard to think about doing anything uh, kind of exotic these days, um, you know, and that really saddens me. Um, uh, my family is from uh, the Ukraine and Russia, and um, I always thought about uh, a, a trip there, but I don't know if it's going to be in my lifetime. Uh, I don't know, maybe. Um, we'll see. We'll see. Um, you know, right now, um, still no plans. I'm just trying to get to New York City to mm -hmm. see the Yakin show <laughs> and, um, you know, some of the other things that are around New York. There's great shows in New York right now. And I'm dying to go. Marty has her hand up. Oh, Marty has her hand up. I see the little hand. <laughs> go for it, Marty. Uh, hey, Barbara, it's so delightful. This is uh, Marty Epp, um, now living in South Carolina. And I, I have been teaching for the past 10 years at a residential high school. Um, you know, I'm primarily a printmaker right now, but I just really wanted to let you know that you made such an impact on me at Mass Art, and um, I remember I did a, like two drawings of a chair early on, and you came in my studio and went, well, why don't you do 20 more of those? And I ended up doing 100 more of them, and, and that uh, enthusiasm uh, has stayed with me, and I, I just really want you to know that as a teacher you made such an impact on me and now I'm sort of trying to pass that on to my students as well and this talk was just delightful tonight and it's great to also see familiar names and hi Luann and um, hi Marty <laughs> people that I that I know and, and care about who I 
left up there. So thank you so much for your generosity, Barbara. It's been delightful. Thank you. Thank you. You're so kind. <laughs> I remember you very well. And I remember <laughs> putting up your work for an award yeah. where, when you didn't, you had an accident. Yes, and, I did. Uh, yep. Yep. <laughs> This is not like her. She's very responsible. She <laughs> won't be here to hang her work. I'm going to hang her work anyway. Oh, my God. Oh you my know? God. And she won an award. <laughs> well, yeah, thank you. You do go all out for your students. And uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Looks like Judy has a question. Okay. Am I unmuted? Yes. Barb, I just wanted to say out loud what so many people have written and what I feel so strongly about. I'm so moved by <clears throat> learning your history and how you do your beautiful work and what inspires you and what an incredible talk you've just shared with us. I'm just, um, I'm awestruck and thank you so much, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate um, your comment. Uh, it means a lot to me, Judy. We've known you for a long time. <laughs> a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think I noticed a few names that were uh, uh, old, old friends. Uh, mm -hmm. So thank you all for coming. I, I really appreciate you spending the time to listen to me. <laughs> No, I always thought no one ever listens to me. <laughs> 52 people have been listening tonight. So <laughs> thank you so much, Barbara, for this talk. And um, we look forward to sharing it out with everyone again and to your future work. And I'm going to have everyone sign off and everyone stay safe. Bye. Have a great night.